Book and Tutorial Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean. This series is going to show you how to install an Oxbeam lighting system on your vehicle. We chose Oxbeam as our lighting system for our rigs because Oxbeam products are very affordable compared to a lot of the competition. We did some research on our own and we got positive reviews from people that have been running the Oxbeam lighting system. Overall, almost everybody that commented was happy with Oxbeam, so I thought it was a very safe choice to go by. There are other options, but some of those options are super, super, super expensive. You literally can spend as much money on lights as you spent on your whole rig if you wanna go that route. But for me and for Sean, we wanted to go a little bit more economical and we wanted to go with the company that has a good reputation and Oxbeam fit the bill for us. For the installs for Sean and I, we are gonna be installing them on our third generation Toyota 4Runners. The install would be pretty much the same if you had a first generation Toyota Tacoma. If you don't have one of those vehicles, you're still going to be able to get a good idea of how to install an Oxbeam lighting system on your rig. This video is going to concentrate on showing how we're going to install the Oxbeam fuse panel into the engine compartment and install the Oxbeam switch panel into the cabs of our trucks. Sean and I ordered different switch panels for our vehicles. Sean chose a six gang switch panel and I chose an eight gang switch panel. And there are some differences. So now we're gonna unbox them and show you what these kits come with. So here's the two kits laid out. On this side, we have the eight gang switch panel set up. And then on this side, we have the six gang switch panel set up. The main difference is the fuse blocks. This one is a little bit narrower and this one is a little bit more boxy looking. But overall, the system is pretty much the same with both. You're gonna have a fuse block, you're gonna have your switch panel to be able to power whatever you wanna power up. With the eight gang switch panel, it comes with a couple brackets. This bigger bracket would be to attach your fuse block to where maybe you wanted to mount this against the firewall or maybe to the fender, that's what this bracket's for. And for the six gang, you'll see the mounting locations are actually built in in this plastic mold. And this is gonna mount right to the side of the fender. For your switch panel, you have a couple different brackets you could use. You have one that will articulate and you'll be able to angle it to wherever you want. Or you have a slimline bracket that will slide right in behind here screw in with the two screws and then you can mount it flush to something. So it's just gonna be a nice slimmer mounting option if you have a spot where you can put that where you can easily see everything. And then just a quick down and dirty of how this thing's gonna get powered up. You're gonna have one side of this wire hooking up to your positive terminal on your battery. The power is gonna go through a built-in fuse and then it's gonna connect up to the fuse block and it's labeled plus and minus for a positive and negative. You're gonna have a negative cable that's gonna attach right here and then run over to the negative terminal on your battery. You're gonna have this bundle of wire that's gonna connect up to this plug and then that wire is gonna run through the firewall to this switch panel. And this red wire that attaches to the fuse block is gonna be butt connected to a Tappa fuse, and then you're gonna choose a fuse that only gets power when you turn the key onto the accessory position, because you wouldn't wanna connect it to a fuse that's always hot, and then that's how the fuse panel is gonna get its power. Same concept applies to the six gang, but this setup's a little bit different. It doesn't have this extra fuse. Here's the power, so it's all connected and same concept applies for the tap of fuse we have this red wire and then this black wire is just going to get grounded the system also comes with a add a fuse as well and then you're going to get all these stickers that you can use to label your switches so you've got pretty much everything you could ever imagine i'm pretty sure with these stickers so you would just peel it off you would affix it right here so then you would know what the switch operates 
Now, the nice thing about these switch panels is they actually have a sensor. So when it's bright out, they're gonna be brighter. And when it's dark out, it's gonna sense that and they're gonna get dim. These all work independently if you wanna click them on. And let's say all six are on in my case or in Tim's case, all eight are on. You can hit the on off and all of them will turn on and all of them will turn off. So for the eight gang switch panel, it comes with some extra fuses. These ones right here are for the 60 amp fuse. And then these are the smaller individual fuses in case you burn one out, you have some extra fuses. And then you get all the hardware that you need to attach everything. So by the look of it, it's a pretty nice kit. And now we're gonna get started installing these in both of our third gen 4Runners. So here's where I have my fuse panel mounted. I copied a lot of other people that came before me. One of them, his name is Min. He operates his own YouTube channel called Faux Runner. He mounted his right on top of the engine fuse panel and he also mounted it to a piece of plastic. I bought this piece of crystallite plastic from Home Depot for about 30 bucks and I cut out a section that was nine inches long and three and five eighths inches wide. This piece looks to be about a quarter inch. I haven't measured it, but I bought the thickest piece I could find at Home Depot because I wanted to run screws into it and I wanted enough meat on it so the screws could really bite well into this plastic. If it was too thin, then there wouldn't be enough meat for the screw to really grab. So after cutting this to the dimension I wanted, I put some Velcro that's really strong. You can choose different grades of strength Velcro. I chose the strongest one I could find, which is 15 pounds, which I do believe now it's a little bit overkill because it's hard to pull this up, but I'll pull it up and show you. I put Velcro in places where it wouldn't disturb me being able to read what all the fuses and the relays are. So I purposely worked around them and put strips of Velcro in those locations. And then I just simply used a drill bit. I bought some small wood screws. It ends up that they would stick through the backside just a little bit. So after screwing the fuse and the fuse panel into this plastic piece, I just took one of the grinder wheels on my Dremel tool and I just dremeled the sharp edge off so they wouldn't be sticking through. You can see that the fuse is attached to the positive terminal of the battery right here. The other side of the fuse routes over and connects up to the fuse block right here. And they're labeled plus and minus, so you can't mix them up. And they even have a color code there. You can see it's a little red right there. And then this one's black. And then I have to hook up the negative. So the negative terminal hooks up here. And then I just grounded it right where the ground wire for the battery attaches to the body right here. Now this panel has to get power from some location and I watched some videos of some other guys and what they did is they used a test light to figure out which circuits are powered all the time and which circuits only power on when you turn the key to the accessory. So I followed their lead and I found one that actually will work. So right here, this is the power outlet. This one only gets power when you turn the key to the accessory or the vehicle's all the way on. Most of these other fuses in here have power full time. And the ones that don't, well, they require you to turn some type of switch on to give them power. For instance, you have the two headlight ones, you have the tail light one, you have the AC, and I don't know what this one stands for, STA. And then you got the rear heater. You can find a fuse in your fuse block in the engine compartment that only gets power when the accessory is turned on. That's the one you wanna use because you don't wanna have power to this fuse block all the time and then you'll drain your battery down. In case you've never used the test light, let me demonstrate. You first have to find a good ground. I have it grounded to the bolt that grounds the ground wire for the battery and my other grounds like for the switch panel. And then at the top of each fuse, you can see some exposed metal on either side. And if I touch it, you'll see that I get a light and I have the key off currently letting me know that this fuse is hot all the time. And then I'll move to another one. That one's hot all the time. What I found out, everything on this row of circuits is hot all the time. 
But then when I tested this one for the power outlet, I noticed that it didn't have constant power. But when I turned the ignition key to the accessory, I would get power. So right now, if I touch the tip of it to the fuse, I get no light. Now I'll turn the ignition key to the accessory position. I'll come back and you'll see that I now have power to this fuse. So the key is in the accessory position. I'm gonna to touch it to the fuse and you'll see it has power. So that's what you wanna find, a fuse that only gets power when you turn the key to the accessory position or all the way to the on position. For this power wire that gives the switch panel power, originally I was just gonna have the wire tucked in to this little crevice where the main power from the battery harness runs to here and powers up this whole fuse panel. Sean came up with a smarter idea. The space that this power wire goes through is big enough to accommodate this red wire and it's a nicer run to where it's gonna be not a hassle to make sure that the wire is not being captured by the cover when you put it in place. So with it following the same path as this bigger power wire, it's totally out of the way and then the wire is just doing a nice little U-turn here from that fuse location and then going down there and then running up here to the switch panel. The next thing I have to do is I have to run the cable that's gonna run to the switch panel to this fuse block and I'm gonna choose to run it right through this path. I have this wire feeder ran through from underneath the dash through a grommet that I've used in the past. I've use this grommet location to run the wire for my aftermarket transmission temperature gauge and I've used it to run the wire for my Eaton e-locker switch and now I'm going to use it to run the wire that's going to go to the switch panel. I don't believe all third gen 4Runners have that unused grommet location. If you're lucky you do have that, if not you're going to have to find a different path through the firewall for your wire. So with this wire feeder set that I bought on Amazon, it has these little doohickeys, dumaflachis, chingaderas. It doesn't come with instructions, but I figured it out. I'm just gonna girth hitch this sucker in here. So girth hitch, you just feed it in and then loop it through like that. So now that's captured. This is the end, the male end has to go through the firewall. So I'm gonna loop this over I'm gonna put this plastic cone head right here over it. And then I'm gonna pull it tight and it grabs it pretty good. So it's tapered to where it'll pull it through wherever you're pulling. At least that's what I'm hoping is gonna happen. So now I'm gonna get inside the rig underneath the dash and I'm gonna start pulling in. My helper, Way, who is also here with us today, he's gonna be watching this thing feed through. <laughs> I went in pretty easy. <laughs> That's what she said. After I pushed the wire through the firewall, I ran it over the top of the heater duct. After it goes over the top of the heater duct, it goes right over towards the center console. And I used the path for the wire right through the area where the ashtray goes. And I'll show you that. So the wire just travels right through this gap right here at the back of the ashtray. And then this is where I decided to mount the switch panel. The way I decided to affix the switch panel to the plastic piece was I used the same strong Velcro that I used to attach the fuse block to the top of my fuse panel in the engine compartment. This way, if I ever want to change the position, it's going to be really easy. I just peel it up. This is a nice and simple way to affix the switch panel to this plastic trim piece without any real permanency to it. I can easily reach the buttons even when the transmission is shifted into the park position, the forward most position. I could still get my hands in here and I could also just reach around the shifter to get the ones on the far edge. My original plan was to locate my switch panel right here. I was going to try to screw it in in this area, but with the width of the bracket that comes with the 8-gang switch panel, I would have to trim away some of the plastic and have to do a lot of modification to make this location work. But 
This seemed like a nice location because it's right there at head level. You don't have to take your eyes off the road very much to operate it. And if you have a newer model, I think 99 to 2002, it has a different trim piece right here with a bigger opening. And I've seen some guys use that opening to either use a sticker or they use Velcro to just put it in here or they screw it into the plastic. But this seems to be also a popular location to install the switch panel. So you could see with the key not in the ignition and the ignition turned to the accessory position, I have no power. There's no lights to this. And this is why you don't want to have your tap a fuse into a fuse that has constant power because then these lights will be illuminated all the time and you would quickly drain down your battery. So I'm going to put my key into the ignition and I'm going to turn it to the accessory. Now you see the switch panel is illuminated in blue. When you want to turn on a circuit, you would just push the button of the circuit you want and it would power that circuit and you would want to put a sticker on to identify what that switch is powering. If you couldn't find a fuse in your engine compartment fuse panel, you can run that red power wire through the firewall and then access one of the fuses in your cabin fuse panel to power up your switch panel. The most logical one to connect to is the accessory fuse and I'll show you in my third generation Forerunner which one that is. And I look at the cover, you'll see that this fuse right here on the left side is the accessory fuse and it's a 15 amp fuse. And this is an ideal location where you can put your tap of fuse into to power up the switch panel. It's this fuse right here. And you can see I already have a tap of fuse right here that's powering up the switch for my Eaton e-locker that I have on the front differential. It's this switch right here. So I connected up one of my aux beam lights to this first circuit. I'm going to turn it on. You can see it has a red LED light to show you that it's powered up. And now let's go outside and I'll show you the light. So this light right here is going to be one of the lights I'm going to install on my bumper right here on either side of my CBI bumper. And then wiring these up is gonna be pretty simple. I'm just gonna run a simple positive and negative to each light. And with this cover, it tells you which connection is positive and which one is negative. And you can see that I have the positive wire connected here and the negative wire connected here. And then this circuit right here is powered with the 30 amp fuse but you can change these fuses to accommodate the thing you're powering up. I'll now demonstrate the effectiveness of the dimming feature of this switch panel. So right now there's a lot of light and the lights on the switch panel are pretty bright, but the sensor is right here. If I cover that up with my finger, you could see how it gets dimmer when it senses less light coming in. So you'll want it to dim in regards to the amount of ambient light that's available. Another thing noteworthy to mention about these aux beam switch panels is they do offer a fancier model than the ones that Sean and I got. They have a Bluetooth capable one that will work with your smartphone, whether you have an Android or an Apple iPhone, and you can download an aux beam app to control the functions of the lights. And you could do some cool things like changing the color of the backlighting. You can operate the switches from your smartphone and you can label what switches do what. And you have momentary function, toggle function, and some other functions I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. But I've seen videos of those switch panels and they are pretty cool. You'll have to decide for yourself if you wanna go that route and spend a little bit more money or go the more basic route that Sean and I got without the Bluetooth capability and to be able to use your smartphone to control all the things you're powering with that switch panel. So I'm done showing my install of the fuse block and the switch panel. Now let's go to Sean and he's going to show you how he did his. So here's where I'm going to mount my switch panel, kind of in place of the ashtray. Another option that I was playing around with is removing these two screws. You can see where they go through into these like metal brackets. 
And then that way you could attach this to the top here. It would be something like that. And I would remove this uh, metal bracket out of the way. For right now, I think I'm gonna use VHB and just uh, adhere it to the bottom and just play with that. And if things change, then I can mount the bracket to the top here in case I wanna change things up. But this would be an easy fix. And the ashtray has been removed. And then the plate as well has been removed with the two screws that screw up there. The VHB tape that is supplied in the kit actually did a great job and it allowed me to get a little bit more angle so that when I'm viewing it from the driver's side, it's kind of tilted upwards. So on my vehicle, I don't have that fancy additional hole on my firewall to run any wires through like Tim did. So I just went the traditional route, went through this main grommet where my amplifier wire is also running. So I pulled the wire through the firewall on my truck. And to do that, I put some electrical tape around a clothes hanger, so like a metal one. But anyways, I just pulled it through and you can see it coming through the firewall right there. That red wire goes to my amplifier for my subwoofer. And then this black wire I just pulled through is going to go to the switch panel from the aux beam setup. So from there, I fed the wire through, making sure to tuck it up underneath nice and tidy so it didn't get in the way if I needed to brake or accelerate. And then you just connect it and then you screw this down and tighten it up so it doesn't get loose on you and, and disconnect itself on its own. Some people report that some water can drip on here and it's a way to get in. So I'm in the middle of uh, developing something that's gonna be like a cover on this and that will just allow the water to kind of drip out on either side and hopefully not sneak into the cabin. So that wire feeds over to the actual fuse panel box and my fuse box is different than Tim's so I didn't put it on top of fuse panel cover. I actually have something else there. The other thing that's unique about my 2000 Forerunner, and I don't have this on my 2002 and Tim and I don't have it on our 98 is this headlight resistor. It typically takes up this hole right here and I'm gonna repurpose that with this bracket that I made to actually mount this fuse block to the fender. But because I had to make room for it as well, it also mounts onto here and just kind of tidies everything up and makes it actually work. So for this bracket, I have some flange bolts. These are M6 and they fit in the back of this bracket and push through and are pretty much kind of like stuck in place. Next, I'm going to mount the bracket to the existing hole in the fender and also the hole I added by way of rib nut. They're both M6. So next I'm gonna put this resistor, ballast, heat sink, whatever this thing is, onto this mount with the stud sticking through. It's really just a bolt sticking through, it's not a stud. And then the two mounting points are gonna go over the threads as well from these bolts sticking out the back of this bracket. And then I got some flange nuts that I'm gonna use to secure this onto there. So now everything is nice and secure. And as you can tell, the battery's out of the way. So that is kind of necessary in order to install this. But once the battery's back in place, you'll still be able to lift up this fuse panel and get to the necessary connections to run your positive wires. Now for the wiring, similar to Tim's, you do have this connection that runs into the engine bay through the firewall to connect to the switch panel. You also have a negative connection, a thin wire. I've actually grounded this to the same ground that the battery goes to. And then you also have a power cable. So this is ran to my positive lug right here. And we have this red wire down here that also feeds into the fuse panel like Tim's. I actually didn't have a fuse location that A, wasn't always hot, and B, turned on with accessory. So what I had to do is jump to one of these that gets turned on by some sort of switch inside the cab. So for me, I did the tail lights right here. So that's where mine's connected. And so essentially, I just have to turn the lights on in order for this switch panel to actually work. So for example, my fuse panel will not turn on with the accessory. It's not on. But when I turn on my light stock, Let's just go to the DRL, for example, or the side lights. I guess it depends on kind of what year you have. Now that fuse location is hot and now my switch panel actually illuminates and now I can start to turn things on and off. So that's how I had to run mine in my 2000. 
Tim has a 98, and so there's gonna be some slight differences between the years and maybe even variations in the trim. Like maybe you have a base model or an SR5 or a limited like us. But I do have a light hooked up here just for example purposes, just to show you how it works. And so my very first location is gonna be positive. And then my negative with these little alligator clips is actually running straight to the ground on the body. So here's the light, these aux beam lights. It's not mounted or anything. It's just sitting there on the bumper just so we could show you. The harness that it comes with, we just completely decapitated it and we just needed this plug right here. So this plug connects. We got some alligator clips hooking stuff up so we can show you. And with my accessory on, my light stock turned on. I can turn it on all the way or just to that. Then I'm gonna hit one of these buttons. So it's on. Now we got light. Pretty cool. These switch panels are pretty nice. So for those of you that wanna take apart your dash and you have a 99 through 2002 Toyota 4Runner, you're first gonna start right here in the cup holder. You're gonna lift this up. Just yank this cup holder up and then you can start to just kind of pry this stuff away. And you have to go in that order. So cup holder, then shifter bezel, and then you can start to peel this back by just pulling it. And it will start to pop out of its clips and then you can get behind the electrical connections, start disconnecting stuff and then you'll have access to the inside here and you can play around with your stereo surround. So that's how I got behind there to sneak the wire through and to get a better vantage point to mount my switch panel down here. Now, I don't think you need to really necessarily remove this for the way that I installed it, but because I was trying to figure it out, I did remove it and just try to check it out a little bit to see what the best way of mounting was. So in order to remove this stereo dash piece in a 96, 97, or 98 Toyota 4Runner, you're gonna go through the same motions of attacking the area where the cup holders are, even though there's not cup holders there, then move to the shifter bezel, then you're going to remove this portion. But this is a little bit different than the 99 to 2002 models because you can't just pull it out. You actually have to access two screws right here that are really holding it in place. So don't just go pull willy nilly. You're gonna to have to remove a couple things. And one of which are these little caps that go on your, your lever. You're gonna to have to remove all these switches. You're gonna to have to get under there and pop out the button for the AC. And now there's no more uh, handles on these switches or buttons. And so you can kind of pry this thing away. There we go. And then you'll see in the corners here, you have a screw here and a screw in this corner that actually secures the bezel to the dash. So don't just go pull on this thing brute force because you're gonna break those tabs and you're gonna feel a tremendous amount of resistance. So those are the key differences to removing the stereo surround in a 98, 97, or 96 versus the earlier model, like my 2000 that I filmed the install in. So I got my dash put back together and here's where the switch panel is. It's out of the way, it's tucked in there. No more ashtray, just gotta give up smoking. And it's still accessible. You can still easily select it and turn on what you need. All right, we are all done with our switch panel and fuse block installs on our third generation Toyota 4Runners. The hardest part is figuring out where you want to install the fuse panel, where you want to install your switch panel inside your cabin. And then once you figure that out, then the rest of it goes fairly simple. If you have a third gen 4Runner or first gen Tacoma, you can copy exactly how we did it. And we copied it from other people. Like I said, that guy Min, who runs his Foe Runner channel, I copied his idea using a piece of plastic to mount the fuse block and the fuse tube, and then Velcroing it to the top of my fuse box inside the engine compartment. Pretty simple. We hope that this installation video was helpful to you. Be sure to tune in to part two where we wire up all our lights and we do a testing of the lights somewhere out where it's pitch black to give you a good idea how well these aux beam lights will work for you. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and our special helper, Way, who showed up, 
mainly to drink beer, but he did some work. Peace out. Happy wrenching. Bye-bye.